This is a CBS News special report. From Washington, here is CBS News correspondent Walter Cronkite. Gerald Ford is 61 years old. He was born in Nebraska and raised in Michigan. He's the father of four children. For 25 years, he was a member of the House of Representatives of the United States Congress. For eight months, he has been Vice President of the United States. In a few moments, he becomes the 38th President of the United States. At that time, he will take the oath of office shortly after noon, a few seconds after noon, according to the schedule, at which time uh, the resignation of President Nixon will have become final. The letter of resignation, according to law, has gone to Secretary of State Kissinger and will become effective in just a moment or two. President Nixon remains president for another five minutes, and he is en route to, to his home in San Clemente, California, by Air Force One, the Spirit of 76, uh, which he, uh, on which he departed Washington at uh, 10.30 this morning. An interesting side note uh, to this morning's dramatic affairs. At 10.30 this morning, just at the time that President Nixon was leaving Andrews Air Force Base, a message went out from Secretary of Defense Schlesinger to the Armed Forces of the United States. And that message said, It is my responsibility officially to inform all commanders, their respective commands, and other defense elements that Richard M. Nixon has resigned his office of President of the United States. Mr. Gerald Ford, the Vice President, succeeds to the office of the President and thus becomes Commander-in-Chief. With all the authority, power, and responsibilities that pertain to that office, including all functions embodied in the National Command Authority. Now, in effect, Secretary of Defense Schlesinger proclaimed Mr. Ford president an hour and a half before he actually takes the oath of office, and the reason for that is quite an ominous one. When Mr. Nixon left Andrews Air Force Base on Air Force One, he left behind at the White House the little black box, as it's called, that is the the button which the President of the United States could push uh, in uh, event of the ultimate holocaust, an atomic war. That uh, was left back here uh, in Washington, and clearly, as of 10.30, the only man who would be available to push that button was still the vice president. So as far as the defense establishment around the world goes, Mr. Ford became the commander-in-chief an hour and a half before he actually will be taking that oath of office. The official letter uh, was a very brief one, the letter of resignation that was handed to Kissinger. It was handed to him at 11.35, uh, just uh, 20 minutes ago, by the White House Chief of Staff, uh, General Haig. It was given to Mr. Kissinger in the White House office that Kissinger maintains, and it simply said, Dear Mr. Secretary, I hereby resign the office of the President of the United States. Signed, Richard M. Nixon. Bill Jones is inside the East Room of the White House where this oath-taking will take place and where the dignitaries and friends of Vice President Ford have gathered. Bill? Well, Walter, the mood, as you can tell, is uh, much different than it was just a few hours ago when uh, President Nixon was standing in this same room uh, saying goodbye to all of his staff. Many of the people who were in this room for that occasion are back. Many of uh, those who worked for Mr. Nixon... Uh, uh, most of the cabinet members, if not all of them, have arrived. Uh, Rosemary Woods uh, is here, uh, along with uh, friends of the vice president. Uh, many of his uh, former colleagues from the House of Representatives have arrived, as well as those from the Senate. Uh, arriving just a few minutes ago was uh, Peter Rodino, uh, chairman of the House uh, Judiciary Committee. Uh, also in the audience... Uh, Former Secretary of Defense Melvin Laird, uh, one of those uh, mentioned very prominently as uh, a possible vice presidential designate. Uh, however, Phil, yes, uh, Walter. right there we can see uh, uh, a, uh, yes, a, a gentleman from the past here, once very powerful, Mr. McCormick, who was Speaker of the House just yes. before Carl Albert, who we see talking he, to him there. He was. There is uh, General Haig, uh, President Nixon's chief of staff, and... Uh, from all indications, uh, President Ford will ask General Haig to stay on. 
Our Secretary of Kissinger, the President, has already announced that, uh, that he will stay in the Cabinet. Entering the East Room now, uh, they're preparing uh, for the entry of the Chief Justice. Uh, and Phil, there are the four children, are there not? Yes. There's Hugh Scott, uh, again, uh, retired uh, House Majority Leader, Speaker of the House, uh, John McCormick. Uh, there are approximately 250 friends of the Vice President who are here. Uh, many, of, uh, many of those who are on his Vice Presidential staff and, uh, and their wives uh, have arrived. There is uh, Michigan uh, Democratic Senator Philip Hart. The Chief Justice, uh, who will preside over the swearing-in ceremony today, uh, had left uh, just a few days ago for a three-week vacation in uh, Western Europe. And at uh, one point, it uh, looked like he would not be here. However, uh, he uh, did get on an airplane uh, late yesterday when uh, the president announced his resignation. He has flown all night and, uh, and will be on hand for this today. Well, there's a rather poignant word uh, this morning from John Ford. Uh, the uh, president's 22-year-old son has been working out in Yellowstone National Park this summer as a forest ranger. He, he wants to be in forestry. It's what he's studying at the University of Utah. And uh, he said that he had no doubt about his father's competence to handle the job, but he didn't Ladies have qualms. So here's his Justice report. of the United States. Justice Warren Berger. Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President of the United States and Mrs. Ford. Vice President, are you prepared to take the oath of office as President of the United States? I am, sir. If you will raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Gerald R. Ford, do solemnly swear. I, Gerald R. Ford, do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute. That I will faithfully execute. The office of President of the United States. The office of President of the United States. And will to the best of my ability. And will to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. President.
Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Mr. Chief Justice, my dear friends, my fellow Americans, the oath that I have taken is the same oath that was taken by George Washington and by every president under the Constitution. But I assume the presidency under extraordinary circumstances never before experienced by Americans. This is an hour of history that troubles our minds and hurts our hearts. Therefore, I feel it is my first duty to make an unprecedented compact with my countrymen. Not an inaugural address, not a fireside chat, not a campaign speech. Just a little straight talk among friends and I intended to be the first of many. I am acutely aware that you have not elected me as your president by your ballots. So I ask you to confirm me as your president with your prayers. And I hope that such prayers will also be the first of many. If you have not chosen me by secret ballot, neither have I gained office by any secret promises. I have not campaigned either for the presidency or the vice presidency. I have not subscribed to any partisan platform. I am indebted to no man and only to one woman, my dear wife, as I begin this very difficult job. I have not sought this enormous responsibility, but I will not shirk it. Those who nominated and confirmed me as vice president were my friends and are my friends. They were of both parties, elected by all the people and acting under the Constitution in their name. It is only fitting, then, that I should pledge to them and to you that I will be the president of all the people. Thomas Jefferson said the people are the only sure reliance for the preservation of our liberty. And down the years, Abraham Lincoln renewed this American article of faith, asking, is there any better way or equal hope in the world? I intend on next Monday next to request of the Speaker of the House of Representatives and the President pro tempore of the Senate the privilege of appearing before the Congress to share with my former colleagues and with you, the American people, my views on the priority business of the nation and to solicit your views and their views. And may I say to the Speaker and the others, if I could meet with you right after uh, this these remarks, I would appreciate it. Even though this is late in an election year, there is no way we can go forward except together, and no way anybody can win except by serving the people's urgent needs. We cannot stand still or slip backwards. We must go forward now together. To the peoples and the governments of all friendly nations, and I hope that could encompass the whole world, I pledge an uninterrupted and sincere search for peace. America will re remain strong and united, but its strength will, be, will remain dedicated to the safety and sanity of the entire family of man as well as to our own precious freedom. I believe that truth is the glue that holds government together, not only our government,
but civilization itself. That bond, though stained, is unbroken at home and abroad. In all my public and private acts as your president, I expect to follow my instincts of openness and candor with full confidence that honesty is always the best policy in the end. My fellow Americans, our long national nightmare is over. Our Constitution works. Our great republic is a government of laws and not of men. Here, the people rule. But there is a higher power. By whatever name, we honor him, who ordains not only righteousness but love, not only justice but mercy. As we bind up the internal wounds of Watergate, more painful and more poisonous than those of foreign wars, let us restore the golden rule to our political process and let brotherly love purge our hearts of suspicion and of hate. In the beginning, I asked you to pray for me. Before closing, I ask again your prayers for Richard Nixon and for his family. May our former president, who brought peace to millions, find it for himself. May God bless and comfort his wonderful wife and daughters whose love and loyalty will forever be a shining legacy to all who bear the lonely burdens of the White House. I can only guess at those burdens, although I have witnessed at close hand the tragedies that befell three presidents and the lesser trials of others. With all the strength and all the good sense I have gained from life, with all the confidence of my family, my friends, and my dedicated staff impart to me, and with the goodwill of countless Americans I have encountered in recent visits to 40 states, I now solemnly reaffirm my promise I made to you last December 6th to uphold the Constitution, to do what is right as God gives me to see the right, and to do the very best I can for America. God helping me, I will not let you down. Thank you. President Gerald R. Ford, the 38th president standing with his wife, Betty. Mrs. Ford had wanted him to get out of politics several years ago. Just uh, about a year ago, he had pledged to her that he would run one more time for Congress and then would retire from politics in January 1977. Now, of course, no one knows. Mr. and Mrs. Ford now departing, followed by the President's military aide, Colonel Sardo. Now leaving the room, Mr. Ford, who said he never aspired to be President of the United States. All he really wanted to be was Speaker of the House, and he used to kid former Vice President Hubert Humphrey by saying that he, Gerald Ford, didn't want to be vice president, but he admitted that as he used to drive home from the Capitol to his small Alexander, Alexandria, Virginia home each night, and he was tired and hungry, he'd drive by 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, and he seemed to hear a small voice saying, if you lived here, you'd be home now. Tonight, he'll be home at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Walter? 
So President Ford has pledged an open and candid administration, saying that honesty is the best policy and that that will guide his administration. He quite clearly means to make a new start in the relations of the presidency to the other branches of government and to the people at large. Robert Pierpoint is outside the White House at Lafayette Park. Bob? The crowd outside the White House here broke into spontaneous applause twice during that brief ceremony that you just witnessed. The people, and there are hundreds of them here, could watch some of the ceremony on our television monitors, and some of them were actually listening on portable radios, and they first broke into applause at the close of the swearing-in ceremony as the Chief Justice congratulated the new president. And then there was a very long, subdued silence here while the crowd listened to President Ford as he gave that simple, direct, and yet somehow a very moving address to the people in the room and to the people of the United States. And at the end of that, the crowd here also broke into applause. There's a marked contrast between this crowd here today and the crowds that have been staying circulating and standing guard outside the White House for the past couple of days. For two days and last night, there was a great deal of partisanship here. There were people carrying signs supporting the president, begging him not to leave office. There were others demanding his impeachment or that he resign. And those crowds were here until the numbers mounted late into the evening last night. Even after the president announced his resignation, they were here. And as you know, the street was closed down in front of the White House for a kind of macabre happening after President Nixon resigned. But today the crowd seems perhaps emotionally exhausted, as we all are, but subdued and curious to learn more about the new president. Walter? Back in the White House, Bob, the uh, larger group that in the East Room heard the oath of office uh, administered to President Ford and his uh, first uh, talk to the people as uh, president is now moving uh, on into the state dining room for a reception uh, which will be following and uh, we'll be back in just a moment when this special report will continue. Headache. All you can think of is relief. But before you take plain aspirin, know the truth. On the average, most of aspirin is still in the stomach 20 minutes after taking. 20 minutes. Take bufferin. It's twice as fast getting out of the stomach and speeding to the headache, and with less chance of stomach upset. Because aspirin or any pain reliever in your stomach can't help your headache. Next time, get fast relief with bufferin. You can do your own thing with fun and with flair You can go through the day with hardly a care With the natural look, the natural feeling To know you're the best you can be Natural Wear Miss Clairol The improved hair color that conditions, covers gray Looks and wears so natural week after week Try Natural Wear Miss Clairol hair color To know you're the best you can be the boss is gonna be here and the house smells of fried fish. Your boss loves it. But to eat, not to smell. Don't worry. Renews It Spray takes the worry out of household odors instantly. We're expecting big things from you, Henry, in your new job. <laughs> Sarah, your fried fish. Oh. <laughs> My cooking got you the job. My talent. With a little help from Renews It. <laughs> Renews It Spray Air Freshener takes the worry out of household odors instantly. Well, Eric Severide, uh, President Ford, in that, those first remarks as uh, our new president, uh, clearly wanted to impart a new start, a new atmosphere in the White House through the president. He said that the long agony is over, but he also was very gracious and his voice broke as he asked prayers for the president, he said to May, President Nixon, that is, uh, May, the president who brought us peace, he said, uh, brought peace to millions, now find it himself. Uh, it, I thought, was a, a very eloquent uh, speech. Somehow in its simplicity uh, and lack of 
emotion except toward the end, more moving than uh, Mr. Nixon's farewell speech this morning. These were not the tones of a, of a man who uh, has any um, lust to uh, see further prosecution of uh, former President Nixon, that's, that's for sure. The keys here, I guess, are his phrases like straight talk. Reminds me of Adley Stevenson, 52. Remember, he said, let's talk sense to the American people. That had an appeal. It's a man without guile, as far as one can tell. He is what he appears to be. Obviously, this is not a man who's going to be preoccupied with building images of himself or PR uh, scenarios, so-called. He is a bit like Harry Truman. I think that's the comparison most people will make. He doesn't have to build images. He knows who he is and who he's not. And that's always the, the safest and the soundest thing in the end. I'm always overwhelmed with this business of the simple, brief transfer of power of this extraordinarily powerful, influential country. Uh, all done so simply. That's tradition. And uh, that's what this Constitution is all about, this these 7,000 words of no document and written document in human history, I guess, has ever lasted as long as this or has worked in the test as well. And I find it very moving. The transfer uh, has come in some odd places, of course, when Coolidge took over from the, the, yes. the Mr. Harding, who just died uh, in a farmhouse in Vermont by a kerosene lamp. His father is the yeah, Justice of right. Peace, giving the oath, and uh, been of course, uh, Lyndon Johnson and Air Force One down in Dallas on a tragic day. And now this, uh, in the dignity of the White House, but under these extraordinary circumstances. Mr. Ford, is, uh, President Ford, has pointed out one thing here that uh, needs pointing out. We, we've all remarked on the fact, and he remarked on it, that he was not elected by the people. A disadvantage in some ways, but he's pointed to the great advantage that he has had to make no promises to anybody. He comes in his own man absolutely. And that's quite an advantage for him and for everybody. I think. After a period of time in which uh, there has been so much uh, suspicion and even proof of influence in high places, uh, that certainly uh, is, is a fresh start. Incidentally, uh, even as President Ford, virtually as, maybe a little bit earlier than that this morning, was taking the oath of office, Secretary, former Secretary of Commerce John Connolly was pleading innocent to all charges that he had accepted a bribe of $10,000 in that milk fund case. It happened uh, almost simultaneously. Dan Rather is with uh, Eric and me in our CBS studio. Dan uh, has heard a lot of presidential statements there in the White House. What did you think of President Ford's, Dan? Well, Walter, one thing that occurred to me that uh, all of those people who were saying before he was sworn in as president that Gerald Ford was not capable of being a powerful public speaker were dead wrong. Uh, this, uh, in my judgment, and sometimes it takes two or three days for a second wave reaction to set in, of course, was an excellent speech, just exactly the right tone, uh, the right demeanor by the part of the new president, President Ford, and I think he said the right things. So that line about straight talk, uh, there's an ache in this country for straight talk. We all know the pitfalls uh, between what a man says and what a man does, but if he can uh, live up to that, and if his future addresses are anything on the order of this one, then we do indeed have the windows open and a lot of fresh air He's going to be going through this White House. One of the things that uh, President Ford seems to understand very well is that a great many people in this country have had enough of the trappings of royalty around the White House and the great growth, and this was not something that was uh, unique to the Nixon administration, but over the past few years, 10, 12, 15 years, been a tremendous growth in uh, what foreigners sometimes call the Caesarism of the American presidency. A bit strong, perhaps, but the the growth of the size of the presidency itself, our expectations of what a president can do, and the trappings, uh, the symbols surrounding a president. Now, here is Gerald Ford, who says that uh, he is a simple man, which is a long way from saying that one is simple-minded, but a simple man. I think Eric is quite right. And here is a man who knows who he is and what he is, doesn't kid himself much about 
what he's capable of doing. One thing, one gets the feeling with Gerald Ford that he's very secure about himself. Perhaps that comes from the fact that he did, as a, a youth, accomplish many of those dreams that other young people simply uh, aspire to. He was a bona fide All-American football player, for example. He, I don't get the idea that he feels he has to prove his manhood to anyone. Of course, the test will come in what does he do. It's fair to say that if you are black uh, and an American, or you're out of work and you're an American, uh, and you look at Gerald Ford's voting record in the Congress, today you may be, may be well saying to yourself, well, is anything really going to change? One can only uh, say to those who are saying to themselves that, that Gerald Ford represented in, in Michigan one district. His time in the Congress was spent as a representative of that district. He now has said in simple language, but I thought quite eloquently, that he realizes that his job is to be a leader of all the people. He certainly deserves a, an opportunity to prove that he can, can be that, that he can do that. Walter, you mentioned this morning uh, Vice President Ford uh, indicating to those around him that he wanted to make his administration build it somewhat on the order of the Eisenhower years with more responsibility to cabinet officers. We, it may be worth marking that President Nixon, when he came into office, said very much the same thing. Uh, what happened in the Nixon administration is that that very quickly went by the boards, that President Nixon uh, uh, intended to give more authority to his cabinet officers, but as things worked out, that didn't happen. With Gerald Ford, we shall see. But it's certainly, in terms of his speech, an excellent beginning. The, the speech had great dignity, uh, even with its simplicity, and, and then I think we were all struck by uh, how well uh, President Ford delivered it. I, I think that we are going to find, uh, with this openness and candor, which he spoke, and which he intends to follow through on, and uh, uh, we shall see about that, of course, but uh, if he does, we're going to find a lot of extemporaneous uh, comments by Mr. Ford, and, and, and we found in his vice presidential eight months, and uh, even those who knew him on the Hill in his 25 years there, uh, he, he speaks uh, uh, ad lib. Uh, his speech is sometimes marked with non sequitur, sometimes even small grammatical errors. Uh, and it's to be hoped, I should think, that uh, in these uh, next couple of years, that too much emphasis isn't placed upon sequitur and syntax. Uh, I, th I think that in the Eisenhower years, we, we the press got off a little bit on onto that. Uh, in, in print, uh, the extemporaneous remarks of President Eisenhower really almost didn't make sense, but you certainly got the idea, uh, strongly delivered opinions by him when he spoke, and uh, uh, I know that in the later years when Eric, I was doing the interviews with him. Uh, I was very much impressed with the fact that, that as you're in his presence, you got the ideas. The transcript doesn't read that way, and that happens to us, too. When I read transcripts of some of our broadcasts, I'm appalled at, uh, at the non sequitur of our own, uh, particularly mine, not yours. Yours read very well, Eric and, no. and Dan's. But uh, uh, I, I think we should we should declare a honeymoon on that right now. Ford speaks from the heart and, uh, and, uh, and, and does uh, make these little kind of uh, vocal uh, gaffes, but uh, the, the idea is, is behind it, and that's the important thing. Early today, before leaving uh, for their home in San Clemente, uh, Mr. Nixon and his family went to the East Room to say farewell to the cabinet and members of the White House staff, and here by videotape is some of that farewell. Here to uh, say goodbye to us and uh, we don't have a good word for it in English uh, the best is au revoir we'll see you again we think sometimes when things happen that don't go the right way we think that when you don't pass the bar exam the first time. I happened to, but I was just lucky. I mean, my writing was so poor, the bar examiner said, we just got to let the guy through. <laughs> we think that when someone dear to us dies, 
We think that when we lose an election, we think that when we suffer a defeat, that all is ended. We think, as T.R. said, that the light had left his life forever. Not true. It's only a beginning, always. The young must know it. The old must know it. It must always sustain us. Because the greatness comes not when things go always good for you, but the greatness comes and you're really tested when you take some knocks, some disappointments, when sadness comes. Because only if you've been in the deepest valley can you ever know how magnificent it is to be on the highest mountain. And so I say to you on this occasion, we leave. We leave proud of the people who have stood by us and worked for us and served this country. We want you to be proud of what you've done. We want you to continue to serve in government if that is your wish. Always give your best. Never get discouraged. Never be petty. Always remember, others may hate you, but those who hate you don't win unless you hate them. And then you destroy yourself. And so we leave with high hopes, in good spirit, and with deep humility and with very much gratefulness in our hearts. I can only say to each and every one of you, we come from many faiths. We pray, perhaps, to different gods, but really the same God, in a sense. But I want to say for each and every one of you, not only will we always remember you, not only will we always be grateful to you, but always you will be in our hearts and you will be in our prayers. Thank you very much. Just shortly after that, uh, President Nixon, uh, Mrs. Nixon, Tricia, and her husband, Ed Cox, uh, took off for San Clemente. Uh, Julie Nixon Eisenhower and her husband, David Eisenhower, stayed back in Washington. And David Eisenhower turned to Vice President Ford, uh, who you see there with Mrs. Ford accompanying the Nixons to the helicopter on the South Lawn. He turned uh, to Mr. Ford and David Eisenhower said, this is a great relief to the family. All the luck in the world. Start, you want to start the watch. The president, uh, uh, at this point, climbed aboard the helicopter with, as you see, a kiss from the lady who was just about to become the first lady, and a farewell hug from Julie Eisenhower, a pat in the back from President to be Ford and then flew to Andrews Air Force Base where there was no ceremony at all. Uh, the family walked directly from the helicopter to Air Force One and took off with only a wave from the president and that symbol again. It is uh, not definite at this moment, but it is believed that uh, the Fords will spend tonight in the White House. Uh, it has been prepared for them. The personal effects of the Nixon family uh, have been removed, whether actually out of the White House or just from the 
closets and personal living quarters uh, we do not know. And the Fords, uh, it's been prepared for them to move in from their very modest Alexandria home. Quite a jump from that home to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. So, as of this moment, the United States has a new president, Gerald Rudolph Ford, and uh, he has given his first speech to the people. This is Walter Cronkite at CBS News in Washington. This has been a CBS News special report, sponsored on a continuing basis by Buffron and Renews It. This is CBS.